to THA Talks for free thought and open minds. And for freedom of speech. Obitelli and welcome to another edition of THA Talks, the alternative podcast show from the UK. Our talks include news, conspiracies, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. If you'd like to check out our full archive, just go to www.thatalks.com to listen to or to download all our free content. And if there's anyone who'd like to contact us and give us some feedback or maybe recommend a guest for the show, you can email us info at thatalks.com or contact us via our website. And don't forget, you can subscribe to the show via our RSS feed and you can also find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube and many other podcast directories out there. Hello everyone, thanks for joining me again here. I'd also like to let you guys know you can add me on Gab. You can find me on THA Paul on Gab there. Also THA Paul on Twitter and THA Talks on Facebook. I'm gonna I want to start using more of those platforms, although I've been banned on Facebook now for two times in a row. That's two months ban on Facebook just for being impolite to a couple of people who are very rude. On the group on the groups, which tends to happen a lot on on social media, you get heated debate, but um, at the same time, I'm getting a bit fed up with social media. I think we should throw ourselves into it more because if we just walk away from it, we're ultimately just giving a platform to another group that can just use it as a weapon against other ideas. So I think as much as there's a lot of censorship, people got to really start throwing themselves, you know, have about two or three accounts and just use it and use it. And, and if they're going to have to get their hands dirty and really start banning people make make sure they, they expose themselves don't give them an easy time i think that's a good plan i'd also like to thank everyone who commented on my last edition 195 james o'brien ignores truth it was ex- an experiment like a, a narration of a caller a caller calling in um, i thought it was interesting there was quite a few comments that were irritated by it so i think i rustled a few feathers there which is which is a good good sign i think and a lot of people that um, enjoyed it. And I will try and do more stuff like that, but it's, it is time consuming because you've got to, uh, you know, you've got to do your research with it and, and uh, it does take a bit of time, but I did enjoy it and I thought it, it went down really well and had a, you know, so yeah, that, that, that's cool. I, I generally encourage people to do more stuff like that because there's so many people like James O'Brien out there that are professional bullshitters basically. And they, they have this attitude that they're the ones exposing the bullshit, which is absolutely not true. But you've got to make sure you have your facts in order, because when you approach these people, they will turn you inside out if you don't have your facts. Uh, really, really, it can be frustrating. You've got to sit down and there, there can be some things that you know are true, but if you can't prove them, you can't use them because they're just kind of lingering there. You've got to get these solid facts. There's enough of them there. You don't need to go for the propaganda. There's a lot of truth that these people are ignoring. you just got to be smart and place them correctly and do and uh, be prepared for it. But I do recommend people start doing that. Um, I'm certainly going to try and do more of it and uh, just give it a go. Uh, even if you just go on social media and start researching facts and, and throwing them out there because, you know, we're all working together on this ultimately, ultimately those, those who want truth. But we've got a very interesting guest today. Um, I've got lots of questions I'd like to ask, and we're going to be talking with Russ James. Um, Russ was on the show last during edition 155 um, when we talked about his party, the Socialist Workers' Party England. They've actually changed their name now. They're called the Socialist Motherland Party, and we've got Russ with us now. How are you doing, Russ? I'm very well, thank you. How about yourself, Paul? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's uh, it's good to have you back on. It's been a, about a year and a half since we last spoke with you. We had a good chat. Um, so w- w- what have you been up to? What's the What's the latest? Right. Well, as you as you said in the introduction, the uh, the party has changed from being the Socialist Workers Party of England to the Socialist Motherland Party of the British Isles, which um, is quite a radical change, really. You know, we sat down and we decided that um, we were sort of an English focused party, having a look. You know, we encourage Scottish, uh, you know, the Scottish Nationalist uh, Party. We were encouraging them for separation of the UK. Mm. 
and um, really we've taken a good hard look at how things are and independence for England would make us a really small weak country and when you look at the way that Plaid Cymru operate in Wales, the SNP in Scotland, Sinn Féin in Ireland, the little globalist parties pretending to be nationalist parties. Mm. So they've picked them off already. So the last thing you need is another party in England that's doing exactly the same thing. It's playing into their game. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that, it's ultimately I'd, I'd say I'm a unionist. I, I Purely because I just think that, that England, Scotland and Ireland and Wales They've got so much in common, you know, more than any other country out there. It it just does make sense to be together. That said, I think when you've got when you look at Scotland, even though they voted to remain, there was a, a massive minority there. You know, forty five percent is not nothing to sneeze at. Um, it, that's that's a problem, you know. So there's something that needs to be sorted. But generally, I think it would be a, it would be a shame because you know we, it'd be like dividing and then all all basically wanting the same thing. So um, yeah, although having said that, I mean obviously Scotland. If if you guys started to get very popular in England, I'm sure that would encourage the likes of 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 the the Scottish socialists who, who tend to be more socialist than the English anyway. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what do you? I mean, the name of the party. I, I'm going to say it. It's. I mean, the last time you was on there, we had people accusing us that we were getting like crypto Nazis on the show because oh, they're really this or that. I mean, you're very, very socialist. I know that for a fact, and we'd probably disagree on, on quite a few things over the course of it. But you've got a lot of common sense, and you speaking to you, fit just you feel like a genuine person you can have a conversation with. You're not one of these antifa types with these hoods that don't even know what they want. Um, so, what I mean, what inspired you to change that? That, that actual call it the motherland um, is it, yeah. Where, where did you get that inspiration from? Well, actually, it's, um, interestingly, the uh, the motherland, Socialist Motherland Party, uh, the idea from that, it, um, it comes from a speech, a very uh, little-known speech by uh, Joseph Stalin, of all people, mm. <laughs> when, uh, when he said that uh, really socialism must be about uh, protecting the motherland. So yeah. uh, far from it being a Nazi, you know, like uh, something coming out of the Nazi area, it comes from the, uh, the very opposite, from uh, the inspiration is actually Joseph Stalin. Right. I don't think anybody. Well, I, I suppose the Trotskyites would accuse him of being a Nazi, but uh, yeah, <laughs> they accuse I mean, everybody of being a Nazi, really. With, with risk of repeating myself from the last interview, what I mean, what figure would you say you you? I, I suppose it's good to bring it up again, anyway, for new listeners on this show. Um, what what what's the inspiration figure wise? I mean, did you support the Stalin regime or or the what person what what um, person do you, have you been inspired? Karl Marx or which one? Well, we take a bit from all over the place, really. I mean, obviously, um, Karl Marx, when you look at his analysis of uh, the decline of capitalism, he, um, to sum it up, really, says that capitalism will um, it will um, keep on producing and producing. Um, everything will go, so like assembly line, like it has. Mm. More, you know, more goods being produced, fewer people producing them. And so you've got this mass of goods that uh, nobody can afford to buy because nobody's working. You know, the standard of living collapses and... His analysis, even though he was right in the 19th century, it's when you look at things now, it's absolutely spot on. You know, so uh, perhaps his his vision for um, the solution to the problem of capitalism might be something we disagree with, but certainly we agree with his analysis, definitely. Well, well yeah, I, th- I think the, the thing is with me, I mean, I'm, I, I'm when it comes to politics, it's more a social thing with me now and, and, and like the issues there. But when it comes to e- economics... I'm kind of undecided, I guess, because I think we're in a modern era now that I think if you have a genuine good government, there's so much at our disposal now that either a capitalist or social mix, there's enough there to make something work in a way. You know, it's a case of which one's the best. That's that's how I see it. But the thing is, um, if if you look at, so, I mean, when it comes to capitalism, when you look at property and just the the, 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 the profit that people are making, it, you get to a point that it's there's none left. They, they've got it all. And that's an issue. I mean, that's something that no one can argue. I mean, you look at property. If some one person owns all the property, then there's literally just nowhere for anyone else to go. That, that That's common sense. As you said, it's just the one part of capitalism that I think is very, very valuable is just, just the simple concept of me or whoever as an individual can create their own means of wealth, their own means of how to make money and that kind of freedom. I think when people lose that freedom, you're, you're treading in dangerous territory. What would you make of that? Uh, well, that's, that is quite um, quite a commonly heard argument. That really, again, you know, people who were defending capitalism will attack socialism, saying, "Oh, well, it destroys the ability to uh, to have ingenuity, you know, to 
to create things. Mm. But the whole ethos of socialism is that it's, uh, it ends exploitation. So, for example, if you've got a large company, say uh, British Steel, which we would bring back, obviously, you know, something like that, employing thousands of people, then all the workers would have a share in it. It would be organised as a, as a cooperative. So there would be no, no exploitation. Whatever you create in wealth, you get a share of it. And then when it cuts down further and further, if you've got um, a sole trader, just somebody working on his own, then obviously there's no he's not exploiting anybody. Nobody's exploiting him. So whatever he can generate is, uh, is all his own. Really, our capitalism as we see it, it's this thing that we have now where you have these faceless corporations, you know, some they're based in different countries. It's all stock hold, you know, stocks and shares. People, you know, people who you, you will never actually meet to the managing directors. They're completely remote. They're all tied in with government. And the whole ethos is to make as much money as humanly possible. And they will screw the workers every opportunity they get. Mm. So, you know, socialism doesn't actually stifle creativity. If anything, when you look at it, capitalism does that. So let's say, let's say, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician. That's sometimes how I earn some money. Um, say, for example, if me and my friends said, right, we're going to start a an ACDC tribute band and we're going to look to get a couple gigs a week to make our money that, would, would we be able to do that in a socialist, I mean, socialist complete society? Of course you would, yeah. How, how would we, though? Because it doesn't all, wouldn't that business have to be owned by the state? No, 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 <laughs> definitely not. No, I think, uh, as I said, that is one of the uh, the major can, major um, bits of propaganda against socialism, this idea that the state owns absolutely everything. That, you know, you, you you have to put your hand up to go to the toilet. It's like being at school, that sort of thing. But, um, socialism is really, it's about bringing the best for all of the people. And, you know, there'd be no place for, there would be no stock market, for example. Mm-hmm. There'd be no making uh, money from stocks and shares, no speculation. There'd be none of that. That would all be gone. Yeah. Um, there'd be none of this buying a house and renting it out to people and taking, you know, basically getting your mortgage paid by tenants and just making a profit on that, all that sort of thing. Making making money by doing nothing would be outlawed. That would be a thing of the past. But, you know, if you can contribute to the to the well-being of society, you know, if you're a good ACDC tribute band, then, uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. I, I, I mean, I take it there'd be a lot of tax, but I, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I know you pay a lot of tax, but you also get a lot of free services or, or mm. cheaper services. So that's, um, but yeah, I mean, I, th- I think one of the, the, one of the things I think that's scary for people with socialism, communism and so on is I think what it is, as I said earlier, I think generally, I think we're at a stage where with technology, the world's such a smaller place. We can, it's easier to make any system work nowadays really than it used to be. But the thing is with socialism, it, it's almost like, it, if you've got a crooked criminal cabal that are running things, I know they can certainly abuse us through capitalism. But if you give them socialists, that you giving aren't you giving them more power? It's almost like even da- more dangerous because they've literally just got even more control over the means of of wealth, everything. Um, what do you think of that? Well, that's uh, that's just corruption, really, and that can yeah. come through any system, can't it? I mean, the, the government that we've got at the moment, the Conservative Party, are supposed to be a capitalist party, aren't they? Mm. And uh, they're supposed to be. You know, doing everything for the benefit of the of the free man, or you know, however you want to put it. Now, uh, the people voted by a, a substantial majority to leave the European Union. And in the run-up to it, the run-up to Brexit, they basically said it's a once-in-a-lifetime vote. You vote for this, you're out. Yeah, mm. If you vote to leave, you're out. And they've done absolutely everything they can in their power to keep us in with this uh, ridiculous uh, checkers plan. Oh, God, which yeah. Will be, it will keep us in the European Union in all but name, they will actually be worse off than being in the European Union officially. It's probably that's all done by yeah, that's all done by a, a capitalist system. You know, you, so if you if you had a socialist government that was uh, was europhile, mm. then mm. would it make any difference? It probably wouldn't. The you know what we need to do is we need to to build a socialist system that puts the country first, that puts the people first. Now, if you look across Europe, you had uh, Enver Hodja over in Albania. Now, he had lots of pressure from the Soviet Union you know, to become part of that bloc. You had Tito in Yugoslavia, there was, there was pressure to become in that bloc. But they didn't. They stayed separate. And when you look at the Soviet Union, again, they had the satellite countries like Eastern Germany, Poland. Look at Europe now. Which are the countries that are free? Mm. It's the Visegrad group, isn't it? It's the groups that were inside the, the old Soviet bloc. Now, the countries that are well and truly shafted are places like uh, west of Germany, like the reunited Germany, that mm. were 100% capitalist. So, 
you know, the argument that um, capitalism will somehow save you from corruption, just have a look at the, the capitalised west of Europe and can compare it to the old socialist east of Europe and which side's free. So, I mean, why then does, I mean, if you look at Venezuela and there's other examples, now I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's, there's no corruption involved there because I know if you've got a capitalist system, they're going to be very eager to expose the socialist system if it goes wrong and stuff. But why does it, why is it always, it seems so easy for the capitalist systems to do that? Because you have capitalist countries that they'll attack other capitalist countries and put sanctions on them. But they manage to scrape by and survive in a different way. But when you look at Venezuela, it's 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 a different. Why is that? I mean, why does it always seem to happen to those guys? Well, Venezuela, it could have been a beacon for hope for the whole of uh, South America, really. Mm. I mean, I'd, I'd say compare um, Venezuela to Libya, for example. Mm. Now, under Colonel Gaddafi, I mean, it's, I know it's, it's slightly changing the subject, but it's not real if you stick with me. Okay. Now, when... Um, under under Gaddafi in Libya, they were going to break free from the gold, you know, break free, have the gold dinar, break free from the uh, the global capitalist e- economic system. They had plans to make uh, to basically batter the uh, IMF out of Africa and make make Africa a rich country again, a rich continent. And the result of that was that the capitalist nations created these hocus pocus stories about exploit, you know, about tyranny inside Libya and all this oh, uh, yeah. going on, killing his own people. Absolute rubbish. And in went the army, blew the place to pieces. In Venezuela, same sort of scenario. You know, he's, he's bringing in these policies that offer hope. And if they spread to the rest of South America, then who's to say they wouldn't spread to North America? You know, socialism is contagious. Once one country proves that there is a better way than capitalism and it succeeds, then capitalism starts to fall everywhere. And they won't have that. You know, the capitalism is a globalist ethos. So... That is one of the, the weaknesses of socialism, if you like. It's, um, it really it exists one country at a time. Like uh, North Korean socialism will be different to Venezuela's socialism, and that's different to Cuban socialism. It's not this monothe- monotheistic thing. Monotheistic? Right. Well, you know what I mean. I know what you it's go not from. Mono- monolithic. Yeah, uh, you use, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing, not nothing wrong with being a bit creative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, the, I mean, the thing is, it's it's... Um, I, I'm as I said, I'm not. Com- I, I wouldn't say I'm against socialism. The, the, I think the the thing where I and this is where it comes into the 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 um, people sort of implying that you might be some sort of a, a crypto Nazi and so on like that. Because I get, we get it here on this show as well. Because of course it's that thing. Anyone that opposes mass immigration and multiculturalism, multiculturalism, they are a Nazi. They're this and that, and it's just such a, a constant thing we see at the moment. But the way I see it, if you if you were to have a socialist state and it, it was to really work, you've really got to have a united culture, a united way of life for it to work. Because ultimately, everyone's paying for, for, for the way of life you have. So it's in your interest that everyone have the same way of life. And, and that's where I would argue um, for socialism. But then when I look at people like um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's, oh, you know, he wants mass immigration, he wants multiculturalism. I can't see how a socialist system like that would work. It would just be so conflicted of interest. You'd have constant arguments about what the state's building and financing. And, and, you know, it's just, it doesn't really seem logical. So what's your view? Is that why that you, is that why you'd say you are against this sort of mass immigration thing, which most socialists nowadays seem to seem, seem to be for and seem to love? Well, when, when you say most socialists are in favour of that, certainly uh, Jeremy Corbyn and uh, your Trotskyites yeah. are in favour yeah. of it. But when you look at Trotskyites, are they not? Are they really socialists? You know, when you see, when you see uh, Trotsky himself, he uh, he did a lot of work allied with the um, with the Nazi organisations. Mm. You know, like with Italy and Germany during the war, he was working to undermine the Soviet Union. Trotskyism, it's always been a problem. It's always been this uh, this sort of um, fifth columnist within the socialist movement. You know, Trotskyism, if you look at it, it's for open borders, it's for mass immigration, it's for multiculturalism, it's for globalism. Mm. The idea is this, even though know, their symbol is this, uh, this world revolution. Now, that only, if you think about who is that going to benefit if you've got no borders? If you don't have any borders, then you can have people can move backwards and forwards, goods can move backwards and forwards. You know, that's capitalism. Mm. <laughs> that is basically it. You know, so... Corbyn, he calls himself a socialist, but he's um, well, I suppose a democratic socialist. He, he's not, he's not a real socialist, really. He's not, um, you know, I'd, I'd shove him in with the with the Trotskyites rather than with the Stalinists, if you like. He's not, yeah. uh, he's not the real McCoy. He's one of these 
namby pamby middle class uh, champagne socialist types. And would you just to get it? I mean, to get it straight, when you're when you guys are talking socialism, are you talking communism? Um, not really. No, because communism is it's another it's an, another step on further. Really, we're we're quite happy just with. I mean, our form of socialism it's uh, syndicalism for the big companies, cooperatives for the smaller ones, guilds bring back the guild system to link everybody together. And uh, communism is a bit more. Bit more cut and dried, really, isn't it? It's everything is owned. That's the one where everything is owned by the state, and we wouldn't go that far because we don't see don't see any need for it, really. Yeah, I mean, this is, this seems to be. Sorry, finish what you say. No, I was just going to say with the uh, the thing with communism, that's where everything's owned by the state, and yeah. that would be the one where you you do your uh, ACDC tribute, and you you've got problems getting it off the ground. Yeah. Now, what's the point in that? There's there's so much bureaucracy. There's so much control. There's no need for it. So, you know, we're happy to, uh, you know, we're socialists and we'll, we'll stick at being socialists. There's no need to go that extra step towards communism mm. or the two extra steps towards anarchy. What, what's the point? Well, yeah, I, th- I mean, I think that's the problem nowadays. With I mean, with even with the far right, ideologies are demonised and, and deliberately, I mean, you don't have to support the far right, and, far right and you don't have to support the far left, but it seems there's just a, a, um, an unwillingness to at least clarify what they are and what they want. It's like, listen to what you say. I mean, socialism is definitely, as you're um, presenting it, it's not it's not communism, and it does have a different um, way of looking at it. But it's obviously, um, I mean, it just seems like the, the cabal, the elite at the moment, they're, they're petrified of anything that's nationalistic. They don't want any national identity, no nations to exist in an independent way with an independent people. They don't want that. They want to dismantle that. And they don't want any independent um, economic machines that they don't control, you know, and I think that's perhaps why we're looking at them, that they attack socialism and they attack nationalism on the right and they kind of getting the left to view nationalism as the enemy and the right to look at, so, and you're getting this this sort of chaotic uh, war, political war going on at the moment, you know, where I think people just need to sit down and talk about politics and forget about left and right and just think about what, what, what sounds like it'll work, you know. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole left and right thing, it comes from uh, the French Revolution, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, and really, we've moved on a long way since then. You know, so why are we still using the labels from France from centuries ago? Absolutely, yeah. No, it's, uh, there's, there's something I want to mention with you as well. I mentioned to you a little bit off air. It's uh, We had a guest on um, recently called Tom Parsons. Now, Tom is the leader of the People's Revolution Party. Now, the People's Revolution Party are um, friends or associates of an online movement called British Fight. And British Fight are kind of like a distant connection to QAnon craze over there. Now, very interesting, British Fight have been do- has been doing its own drops and some predictions of the political affairs that's going on here in the UK. And basically, the, the whole agenda, and I think this is a part of a greater agenda from even the QAnon movement, is generally to create like this pan- um, and populist movement that just opposes the cabal at the moment. Now, I don't, I don't know if it's meant to be this long-term master um, party that rules us for the rest of our lives, but it's just like a, a mission to take down the authorities that are running the show at the moment. And um, they basically are going to approach lots of parties and talk to them and say, "We are you on board? You know, would you would you uh, help help promote what we're doing?" And then perhaps, I don't know what they're playing, perhaps if they get their goal, then it's okay, see you later, now we're enemies again and we, we'll we fight over who, who who takes it from here kind of thing, you know. Would, would that be, I mean, how what does that sound to you when you hear that? Well, it's interesting you should say that because um, we have as, a, as an organisation, we've been approaching parties in, uh, in Italy, Germany, yeah. Sweden, uh, Ireland, well, uh, the United States even, which, uh, you know, we are the Socialist Motherland Party of the British Isles, but we are open to contact with parties from other areas. Now, some of the parties we've spoken to are third positionists, some are Strasserite, some, you know, some you would class as far right, some, some you would class as far left. But the idea is to bring them all together. And, you know, we're not going to have the same ideas. We will disagree very strongly on a lot of issues. But where it matters, we're trying to build a cooperation. And from what you've described from this uh, you know, British fight and the rest, you know, and the umbrella organisation. That sounds like they're doing the same sort of thing. Yeah. So, you know, they're not being in touch with us yet, but if they certainly want to, it'd be, <laughs> it'd be interesting. Right. Why I not? Mean, yeah. I mean, well, I think I think that you, let's let's get rid of the uh, secret pedophiles and in, in government and get all these and these absolute corrupt systems that are draining resources from the nation, and then 
And then maybe after then, people can sit down and, and have a, a good crack at governing the countries. Because I think at the moment, there's so many issues like that involved. It doesn't matter what your political ideology is. There's just these blocks in the way. And I think, I think people have got to get around to that now. They've got to think, well, look, hang on, it doesn't matter whether we push a socialist. I mean, obviously, there's got to be a degree of compromise in something like that. Um, you know, they're, they're not, you're not going to get like a, a libertarian ideology and all the socialist parties are saying, yeah, you know, let's um, shrink the state. You know, that's not going to happen. But I think if they can get the fundamental real issues that are, uh, exist in the West at the moment, stop all these wars, dig all these pedophiles out, which is blatantly, they're not just in government, but in Hollywood, in, in the music industry, which I reckon goes so deep. I mean, people would be shocked, I think. Um, you know, and that that's... Um, I think that's what we really need to do before we can uh, really have a proper crack at a genuine government, you know? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's um, like to use the American metaphor, time to drain the swamp, isn't it? That's ab- absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, the thing is when Donald Trump, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Donald Trump politically isn't your, isn't down, uh, isn't like up your street, but the yeah, thing no, is... He's, a, he's, a, he's an out-and-out Zionist, he's a, he's a little lapdog of Israel, so oh, yeah. uh, no. <laughs> well, the, well, the, 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 I mean, the thing is, yeah, I mean, it, there's always that same theme that they always follow the same agenda. But the thing is, I think to some degree, you've got to do it to an extent, otherwise you won't last. You know, you don't know whether these people are just, just uh, appeasing things just so they can um, get something done. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I when, t- when Trump got in, I said I'd give him a couple years and then I would, uh, I would judge him then. I've, he's given, he, I've given him a couple of years. I think, you know, he hasn't been a disaster, the, what all the liberals were, said he was going to be. Like, oh my God, he's going to do this and that. And I think, Considering he's regarded as this far right Nazi, you know he's he's actually been pretty centrist in a lot of things he's doing. All right, he's, he's cut tax, um, cut taxes, and he's certainly not been one for the socialists. But I think, as I said, I think for what America need at the moment, he seems to be filling that hole, and he's doing more across the board. You know, I mean, you look at what he's doing with North Korea. Whether that's whether they're going to now become capitalist, I don't know, but it's. It's an interesting situation, in a way. I mean, um, is it, so? Would you say that you're totally against what Trump's doing, or do you think he's done things better than what others have been doing? I'll say in Trump's favour. I mean, obviously, if Clinton had been made president, which she was supposed to be, then uh, there would have been a war against North Korea. And the situation in Syria, the chances are, would have seen Americans bombing the living day out of it even more than they've done under Trump. Yeah. So, really. I would say that uh, compared to what Clinton would have been, then obviously anything's better than that. But um, when you look at his, his pledges, you know, he said he build this this big border wall, he protect the borders. Uh, he hasn't done that. He'd uh, restrict immigration to from uh, countries with a major terrorist problem. He's not done that either. It's, hasn't he started? I, I thought he'd started to build the wall. Build, there was photos of them picking the right type or something, but they've got to keep getting the mm. finance. I, I might be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure they... <laughs> I don't know, but the uh, well, yeah, he, you'd have thought by now when you think that the uh, the West Bank wall, how quickly that went up. You'd have thought that uh, the time he's had to get his wall going, it would oh, be yeah. uh, well away. But uh, oh yeah, I mean, there's definitely that that um, I mean, the the Zionist thing. It always seems to. I, I think it's just generally that they've they've just got so much money. There there are. I mean, I know people say it's a it's not a conspiracy. You get a lot of wealthy Jewish people that have a lot of control, lobbying control in the West and stuff. And um, I'm not sure I buy into the all conspiracies that it's just that their agenda to uh, take over. Um, Cause I think rich people will all want to take over the world and stuff. It just so happens you get a lot of smart Jewish people that are, you know, um, involved in, in, in politics and a lot of money and stuff. And it seems to be, but at the same time you, you get a lot of these Zionists that seem to um, be very pro Trump, very, very like, you know, like the Breitbart's uh, Andrew Breitbart and stuff there. All right. They're Zionist. But I don't. As long as they they're consistent with saying, well, okay, but Britain's Britain and Britain should be Britain and America's America and America's for Americans. As long as they're consistent with their argument, okay, Israel they want that, but they also want America. They also want Britain. They also want France and and Europe to be Europe. So my view is, as long as they they sing that line and, and are consistent, then I'm 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 happy. You know. Oh, no, I'd have to disagree with on that one. Yeah. Now, uh, Zionism, it's it's only good to say that uh, Zionism is an ethnocentric ideology that um, puts the, the Jewish nation first. Mm. Um, you know, if that's as far as it went, then it would be fine. But it's actually, it's um, it's a, a Jewish supremacist organi- you know, ideology, which 
you have this ridiculous concept of uh, God's chosen people. You know, this oh. invisible man in the sky. He decided that uh, these people in the desert said, I like those. They're the ones. They're going to be the masters of the world. Mm. <laughs> but it's, and the Zionists are actually they're trying to put that into practice. Yeah. So it's, I it's mean, not so much that they are pro-Jewish. Yeah. It's more that they're anti-everybody else. Now, if you go back to the, the Second World War, you had a lot of rich Zionists um, cooperated with, uh, with the Nazis. Mm. And you look at the, the transfer agreement that, you know, the Zionists with money were transferred out of Germany into Palestine. And the Jews that had no money were transferred into places like Auschwitz. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, the Zionists, they're not even pro-Jewish. They're, they're pro-Zionist and that's it. And if, you, if you're the wrong kind of Jew, you're in as much trouble as everybody else. Well, yeah, I mean, that there's been times where there's been arrests out there from, from Jewish people themselves. The, th- the thing is with me as well, I mean... I'm, I've I've researched over the years a lot into the occult and that side of things, and I think a lot of it is more cabalistic. It's like a twisted interpretation of the of the Kabbalah, and oh, yeah. this is practiced by a lot of people out there, a lot of non-Jewish people, and all that. And I think there's a dark element to it. I think that's really where the elite comes from. So it's it, it's it's Jewish in the sense of it's a, an occult, um, mystical Judaism, if you like. Um, but but it's it's something a bit more. I, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's completely political. I think it's actually a, um, kind of like a, a prof, prophetic, um, deep and mystical. You know, f- run through secret societies. I mean, people will bring up the Freemasons. I'm absolutely sure that there are some very dodgy Freemasons. We've had some very good Freemasons on the school. I know, not on the school on the show. I know a few Freemasons that I trust and think are very nice people. So I don't think it's as simple as people can say it's the Freemasons. But I certainly think in areas of Freemasonry and beyond and in other secret societies it exists. And it's, yeah. I think it goes a bit deeper, but that, that's probably for another show and stuff. But it's, uh, it's intriguing stuff. And it's, it's certainly there, you know, we can't deny that. Well, yeah, I'm saying even, it's, it's definitely something for another show. But yeah, just to touch on it. Yeah. And I've met some, some Freemasons myself and they do, they do a lot of good work for charity. You know, they'll they go to the lodge, they pay their, um, their membership fee every year, which is quite substantial. And they literally, they go around raising money for local causes. And, you know, you take it out of them, why not? But um, as it goes up the ladder, or up the pyramid, if you like, once you get to the uh, the shady areas at the top, different story altogether. Yeah, well, that that's just it. It's, it's uh, y- I think when you get a lot of power, they'll want to bring you on board. And, and as I say, it, it's it's a club. I mean, I th- and I think they would be happy to, to sacrifice a load of Jewish people if it meant they were going to get their... Do you know what I mean? It's 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 a very. I think it goes a lot deeper than what people think. That's that's my opinion in a way. I think oh, yeah. over over the course of 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 the years I've researched into this stuff, it seems to be something because what they're doing as well, the elite in the world, they just have be able to have such a grip of what's going on. Um, and that's why I'm hoping this Q and on thing is right because that'll be fantastic. But it could also end in tears. But we shall find out. <laughs> Fair Another thing I wanted to uh, address, and this is, and sometimes this is again linked to the the you know the, the Zionist thing. Although again, it's Most more, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's more of an ideology that came from Germany, and that's the Frankfurt School. And this is something that I think is controversial when it comes to socialism, because the, I don't know if you know that the theory is is they were from Germany, they were kind of um, communists that were disillusioned with how things went in the Soviet Union, but also hated capitalism. They didn't understand why Europe didn't, the lower classes didn't unite with everyone and were more loyal to their cultural roots and their, and their nationality. And uh, so they decided to come to America and create what is, what is the critical theory and what we know now as cultural Marxism. Yeah. And this has been eating away at Western society, at its religious institutions, that, you know, the, the genuine roots, our education, creating Hollywood to brainwash us. To do all this, and so that then they can um, build what they think is their, their their communist global empire or whatever it is. I mean, that's very interesting to me, and it's 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 difficult to argue against when you look at looking what's going on in society at the moment when it's now seems to be coming into fruition. Um, what are your views on the Frankfurt School and that? And d- oh, d- well, it, it also, you know, so it all it ties back into uh, good old comrade Trotsky again, doesn't it? Mm. You know, Trotsky was he was kicked out of the Soviet Union for basically being an infiltrator, being a, a capitalist stooge working on the inside to destroy things. Now, when the revolution happened, Lenin publicly stated that uh, there have been pogroms, there have been all sorts of you know, mass killings, poli- you know, police brutality, and that the Soviet regime would have none of that. 
Now, uh, Trotsky, as the uh, leader of the secret police, he basically put into place mass killings and, uh, you know, the, the Kronstadt uh, massacre and things like that. He uh, was it was an all round nasty piece of work. You know, he's, he's got the blood of millions on his hand. And the Frankfurt School, it all ties in very nicely with uh, with Trotskyite ideology. It's all this open borders, globalist, everybody being made exactly the same sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, the Frankfurt School, it definitely, when you say it's it's tied in with the media, yeah. with Hollywood, it's it's there for everybody to see. And you've got your uh, your Antifa crew. Oh, dear. They, right. uh, <laughs> they take their orders from George Soros, this, uh, this massive, massively rich billionaire who, uh, you know, Antifa are they're about as anti-working class as you could possibly get. You know, they're, they're all middle class students. There's a lot of a lot of police members. They're they're all tied in. It's it's a very nasty organisation. But yeah. um, without the Frankfurt School, none of this would have been popular. You know, possible. Yeah. Well, it's it, it, it's just so much apathy. You argue with these people, and it's almost like they have a slight advantage of you over you because they simply don't give a shit about anything. And if you're a human being that cares about your environment and your people and what's going on around you you're emotionally attached to it and you argue with these people and you can tell they could not give a shit. They don't care if it all goes down. They've just got no real um, apathy to them. They're just empty. They just seem empty. Whether, I mean, I'm sure I try to, to, to be as diplomatic as I, as I can. I think that a lot of them are brainwashed, you know, a lot of them, and I'm sure a lot of them do wake up. You do hear stories where they, Oh, I used to be into that and I kind of woke up and now I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more conservative socially. As I said to you, it's, it's a social, this is why I'm more, conservative socially as opposed to when i listen to guys like you i'll admit it you kind of said it to me the socialism if 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 you were um, in government um putting in place what you see as socialism then then it's it's interesting it's it's i think i think if jeremy corbyn was more like you he probably would win an election if he if he had the same perspective because all the working class people would, would still vote for him all the people now that are cheering for tommy robinson and and, and voting UKIP and wanting other populist parties or reluctantly voting for Tories just because they think they might deal with immigration a bit better, which they won't, um, they probably would vote for, for a party like you. You know, that's, it's, it's, it could be interesting. Well, yeah, if uh, Jeremy Corbyn was a, was a real socialist rather than this uh, Trotskyite imposter, then uh, we'd, we'd collapse our organisation. We'd all go and join the Labour Party and help him along. Mm. But uh, he's not. Right. And w- what do you make of? I mean, recently he's he's obviously been attacked for being an anti-Semite. Um, recently, what are your views on that? Do you think that he is, or is it just um, a way to get him out? Or what, what are your views? Well, the thing with uh, Jeremy Corbyn is he's publicly stated support for Palestine, and he's um, what was that thing? It was uh, Luciana Berger, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. you know, the, the Zionist MP who gets offended at absolutely everything and goes running off to the police at the drop of a hat. Mm. Yeah, she's the one that's uh, got to be in a bonnet about this. Because he said that, uh, what was he said that uh, Zionists, they didn't understand English irony. And she's gone, oh, you know, this is, this is racist, this is anti-Semitic. He wasn't calling out Jews at all. He was labelling Zionists as humourless and basically... You know, like people who really shouldn't be here. You know, they've got this ideology. They're, they're so fixated on Israel. What are they doing here? You know, mm. and you, you can't really argue with that. You know, if it's it's like Rastafarians who you see walking down the street carrying their "I want to go to Africa" thing. Oh, go then. <laughs> well, this yeah. is this is just it. it's, it's when when I say to people, I say, "Oh, I don't believe in multiculturalism." They they assume that that's kind of means that I'm some kind of white nationalist that just want a, a white utopic state. No, multiculturalism is multiculturalism. You can have, yeah, if you want black people here, Asian people, as long as they are singing along the tune to the British way of life, British culture, and being loyal and respectful to the British heritage and what we are here, then that's okay. But it's, that's not multicultural. We have one culture here, Britain, and people should you know, um, to, you know, be British or go and be somewhere else. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not a bigoted thing to say. Bigotry is when you want to change something, you come here and say, I don't like it here, I want this and that. That's bigotry. When you're already here and you say, no, we like it as it is, please don't change it. I, I don't see that as bigot, bigoted. you know. And, I, and as I said, I think for, for the socialists out there, if you really want a system to work socially, it's got to be a united, a united culture. It's got to be, otherwise it's, it's going to struggle. Yeah, I mean, it's like when, you, when you leave the country and you go on holiday to another place, you might go there for the, for the better weather. But mm. um, 
you know, if you want to enjoy the culture, you want to go and experience something that's different, don't you? Yeah. You know, and the way things are going, multi- multiculturalism, it's, um, it's a bit of a false label, really, isn't it? Because multiculturalism, it should be really called anti-culturalism. Yeah, what well, it is, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, um, you know, it starts off, you have your majority population and these other populations side by side, all operating independently. But that's not where it ends up, is it? You know, each, you know, like say, for example, there's all this talk about, um, you know, like attacks on the, on the native European culture, which there definitely are. But, um, but there's also attacks on the, on the Muslim population of Europe, on uh, all the immigrant populations, that they're all under attack from the same way. Everybody's got to accept this ludicrous trans agenda, this uh, sexual free for all. You know, there's everybody's in, encouraged to basically abandon their culture and just adopt the culture of shopping, effectively. Mm. And yeah. So you know, multiculturalism. It's not just attacking one culture; it's attacking. It's it's a multi. Uh, it's a multi pronged attack. It's attacking every culture in the world. Yeah. Well, that's that's it. I mean, I I like culture. I think you know, if I I'd like the fact I can go to Africa and experience a completely different culture. I can go to Japan, China, um, all around the world, and you just see a different place. It's 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 genuine, um, you know, uh, it's, it's genuine diversity. If you sort of mix it in a bit, everything in a melting pot, it loses it. It loses its potency. And I think us here, the thing is, when you argue with some of the sort of the, the liberal extremists, I call them. In, in the UK here, it's it's almost like they're saying, yeah, but what culture? What culture? Anyway, it's like exactly. It's been it's been it's been been diluted for so many years now. You're you're beginning to not even recognise it. But actually, if you look back in history, Europe had a fantastic culture, and it's still there in signs. It's still salvageable. But people have got to want it. People have got to want to save it and to to identify it. And it's a, that's the problem at the moment. It comes back down to the apathy again. Who are we? We're nothing anyway. Oh, don't worry about it. It doesn't exist anyway. You know. It's like um, if you take architecture as an example, mm. you look at the architecture of uh, of this country, and then you compare it to the traditional architecture of uh, of our neighbours. And the further away you go, the more different it becomes. And then you have a look at modern architecture, and it's exactly the same in any city anywhere in the world. It's exactly the same. It's completely soulless, and that's what they're doing to buildings. And that's what they're doing to people. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And 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 it annoys me when they're when these people target. Um, Socially, going back to the social side of it again, when they target our children as well, because they don't want, you know, again, with the old sexual thing, they, they, you get a lot of transvestites that are going to schools. And what's your obsession with going to schools? Wait till they grow up, for Christ's sake. You know, yeah. it's, it's trying to get into their heads. And that, that's what annoys me. But the same thing is they slowly, I mean, I will say my nieces, I speak to them. I deliberately, I always speak to them and find out what they're learning at school because I'm curious. And I'm quite, she hasn't said anything to me that, that's made me worry. She's kind of, uh, She's learning a history and she loves London and all this kind of stuff. And that I, I find that quite good. But, um, but I think round in certain areas around the country, it is, it's kind of like they're teaching them not to be proud of their own, history, you know, teaching them other cultures and stuff. And they shouldn't, they should look, you know, it should be all about Britain or all about France, wherever you are, you should be proud and, and promote that culture. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm all in favor of, you know, let's, let's bring back some national dress. Let's, uh, you know, let's really get immersed in our culture. Yeah. You know, because because being proud of your country, being proud of your culture, you know, being being a patriotic socialist, is um, it's about wanting the best for your for your people. You yeah. know, it's, it's like your extended family. Mm. The nation is the family. That's right. Um, it's like living in your house, and you look around the house, and you want to do it up and make it the best that it can possibly be. You know, the globalists would have you would would say, "Oh, that's really Nazi thinking." That is, you know, it's it's the it's the idea that you want to make your own house look nice, so you want to go and smash up your neighbour's house. Yeah. Ludicrous. That's right. <laughs> I mean, it is. It's that. That's when I start to get red pilled. I kind of I, I I remember thinking to myself, "Why is it so uncool to be patriotic?" It's almost like you think about it, it's so uncool to actually like your country and, and think good about it and want, want to help it. And, you know, it's almost like, oh, sod the country. You know, and, I thought, and then I thought, so wouldn't it be really good to actually love your country? How cool is that, that you literally, you know, I really like my country. I'm proud to be here. I want to help it and make it better. You know, that's actually really awesome. And, and it's like, it's just kind of that, that feeling's gone. It's all about we're crap, we're shit, let's smash it down. And people, and although these anarchists, they, they, they call themselves socialist or communists, they've got no idea of what they want to rebuild, you know, bring it down. And then you're like, well, and then what? 
and then it's going to just grow by itself. You know, they, they forget all the hard work that's gone in to build it to begin with. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? With, with, your, um, with the hardline extremist liberals, they've got this idea that, uh, you know, it's this this example recently I saw in the, in the newspapers, this uh, unmarried mother in Belfast has successfully won a case to, um, to get widow's benefit. Mm. Now, marriage is supposed to be a solemn thing between two people. Now, if she could not be bothered to marry her husband, then why should she get widow's benefit? Yeah. It's, um, it's a nail in the coffin of marriage, which, of course, the whole the liberal idea is to do away with marriage. Everybody you can just shack up with anybody. It doesn't matter. You know, no values. Your children can be brought up by the state. You know, you don't have to mm. put anything into it. It completely just everybody has been reduced to this individuality, which um, you know obviously we are individuals, but we are more than individuals. We we belong to the whole. You know, we all work together. That's the, that is the difference between socialism and individualism. We respect each other. We want to work alongside each other. We want to help each other. Yeah. But um, but your liberal extremists, they just want to, as you say, smash everything down. You got yeah. this uh, this nonsense of gender fluidity. You know, you wake up one day and you think, "Oh, today I'm called Jane," and, and then half, you know, half past ten in the morning you're called John. Yeah. And the man and, and the man hating as well. God, <laughs> it's just like I'm sorry, I'm a I'm a guy and I'm I'm not a feminine. I can't help it, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, with the with the trans lot um, as well as uh, there's a lot of these attacks on on feminists as well. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, there is a lot of feminists are starting to sort of smell the. Smell the coffee, so to speak. I think they're still because they've got the, the, the feminists. I mean, it depends. I mean, I personally think I don't know why feminism started and created an angle feminism. Just stick to egalitarianism and and be inclusive for everyone. This that's what it is. All right, it's got a history in the past. There was the vote and stuff, but I I, I don't think that was. I mean, people equate that to oh, this, it's feminism. I think that was just uh, uh, like um something that needed to evolve you know it's like you would have had men that were working silly hours they got that sorted as well it was like well hang on now you're going to get some holiday time off you're going to get the weekend and and so on it was all part of a process that of course life was going to change and of course women weren't going to just stay in the kitchen and um you know like that and as the family unit stay like it was in the 50s things were going to change but they kind of used that as a way of it it was it was a weapon against them and um, by men, and that's the danger now. So now, like women, basically look at the patriarchy as a weapon against women, and it's almost like masculinity's lost a bit of respect and, and is looked at as as the blame for all of the, all of society's problems. I mean, where do you sit with that? that? That's I mean, I haven't actually asked you about feminism yet. Maybe this is something that you'll you, you'll defend. I mean, what what do you think of feminism and, and what I'm talking about? Well, I think when you when you look at the uh, the history of it, um, the the country was it was run by the aristocracy and the and the the ruling class, wasn't it? Mm. You know, all it was very rich men, all from the uh, the elite families, and they ran everything. Women didn't have a look out, you know, didn't have a look in at all. The working class didn't have a look in. You know, everything was controlled by this, you know, self chosen elite group at the top. Yeah, and over time. Bit by bit, through uh, through the work of trade unions and uh, groups like the suffragettes, you know things have uh, have progressed, and we've we've basically we've we've got a little bit more. You know, we're getting crumbs from the table now. Yeah. You know, before we weren't even getting crumbs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, it's the whole identity politics thing. It's just when we seem to be moving along somewhere and actually making you know bringing some sort of justice for the whole nation, then they start to divide us. You know, they pit men against women. Yeah, and yeah. You know, they, they bring up all, all these identity politics, uh, things like sexuality, gender, um, all sorts of things, you know, physical ability, status, all these things they're brought in to divide you. It's like even uh, immigration. Yeah. It's an example of that. You know, when you've got a homogenous country, say when Britain was still British, mm. you know, I mean, there's, there's always been immigration here. There's always, I mean, there, there was a, a black mayor of London, what's in the... 1900s or the 1800s right because the 18 there was a black mayor of london you know so there's been immigration here for a very long time but um when you bring it into massive levels then you can say oh it's the pakistani community against the afro-caribbean community against the white working class community and it's all divide 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 all the way along the line and i think feminism has fallen into the same trap yeah yeah started off for you know to basically women were being treated appallingly Mm. And we see we were moving along from that. Things were getting better, and now you've got the trans the trans lot <laughs> basically saying, "Oh, today I feel like a lady, yeah. so I'm going to go into, go into women's only spaces." Yeah. 
Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's I've, we've we've had um, guests on before that have, have brought that up, and it's it is an issue, and rightfully so. I mean, I mean, the thing is, yeah, you look back at women's life. I mean, before contraception, I mean, what was it like to be a woman? You know, you were basically you were a, a baby machine, and it was, you know, you, your their lives were very limited, and absolutely, you got to understand, respect that, and absolutely, I respect the fact that we've managed to evolve so that women can have more of look at the world and and take more choices and what they want to do with their lives and stuff. And I don't think anyone's gonna bitch about about that happening i think that's that is as a cliche from the liberals it is good for everyone good for men as well absolutely is but um but what what's happened is it's more what feminism has done now it's got into the psyche of women and and it's starting to change who they actually are you know women want babies women they get to a stage where they actually want babies and actually having babies is a is a brilliant thing for women most women you know that most women aren't going to have a career that's worth jacking in for a child, you know, most women are just going to have normal jobs and having a baby is going to be one of the biggest things in their lives. And that, that's a great thing. Being a mother is fantastic. And it's almost like what feminism has done is it's gone past the let's liberate women and give them more choice in, in society and let them loose a bit more to actually going, you know, don't don't think you have to be a mother. Being a mother's lousy, you know, don't worry about that. And it's and as a result, our birth rates are going down. I think women are getting more miserable. You know, that that's that's where it's gone wrong. Well, yeah, it's, it goes back into the uh, the Frankfurt School again. Absolutely, which, you know, yeah. you know, so under the you know the the feminist ideology, really, it's um, you used to have that women, they if they if they wanted to work, they could work. When they uh, wanted to have children, they stopped work. They had children. They stayed at home, mm. and they had families. And as you say, it's all been turned around. Like, oh no, it's uh, you really need to have this new designer crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really need to go out. And buy this thing that costs a fortune because you need it because this yeah. should define you. You know what goods you have around you that should define you. That should be the be all and end all. So to sacrifice, you know, you have to sacrifice having children, having a family. Yeah. Uh, when you're older and you look back on your life, you might be surrounded by all this, you know, nice shiny crap. Yeah. The chances are you'll have probably bought it on HP anyway, so a lot of it will have gone back anyway. Mm. Or you know, when it comes to when it comes to old age, the government will say we're taking that off you because we're going to stick you in a home and that will pay for it. So. At the end of your life, you've worked yourself half to death to acquire all this rubbish, which the state has then taken off you anyway, and you haven't got any children to look after you in your old age because you didn't have any, because you sacrificed it all to buy this this rubbish. That's you know, what's the use in it? Yeah, yeah. You know, in the Soviet Union under, under Stalin, they used to have this uh, this thing called the the Medal of Motherhood, and you know, it came. It was one of the many things that Stalin did that was absolutely fantastic. You know, you were paid to have children yeah you know a woman you could be a single mother you know or a married mother obviously the married was was preferred option but it's you know if you're a single mother you weren't discriminated against and if there were children up for adoption you could have you know say eight children four of you four of them your own four of them adopted and you were given a medal for that you were given good money for it Mm. it was motherhood was valued and this, the Frankfurt School thing, it basically says that motherhood is wrong, yeah. and yeah. it's it discourages. It's seen as you know having children is actually seen as a failing. Yeah. But, you know yeah. what could be a better success than actually bringing up the next generation? What is more important? At the, at the end of the day, through all the the, the, the ages that women have grown up, grown up in, all right, there's been periods where their, their lives have been very not much option within their lives. But one thing is for sure: being a mother is probably the, the most important job. In, in all societies, you know the the oh, you know obviously parents are. I'm not I'm not do, playing down the, the the male, but this is when I will get a little bit feminist. I think a mother is the most important, especially at the young age. You know when the, when a child's very young, a mother is so important to them. And then as they get a little bit older, the father's job comes into play where he's a bit more discipline. You know, give, teach them discipline, which in fact we're looking at society now. A lot of the black communities killing each other what's one of the prime similarities of all these 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 youth youths that are getting banged up or killed they haven't got a father you know and that's and, and that's that's another issue so um but anyway yeah i mean we can get fire on to lots of things is there anything i mean what i'd like to ask is do you think things are going to change do you think that socialism is socialism in t- in terms of how you see socialism you know the the correct um, socialism let, let's call it for this for this show um do you see that making progress do you see are you positive or are you a bit pessimistic and just kind of making the best of it well i think actually when uh, when you talk to people involved in uh, like the communist party of britain the marxist leninist uh, lot 
and various other socialist organisations, there there are quite a few people out there who have basically their eyes are open. They can see that the Frankfurt School is a complete load of rubbish. That Trotskyism is, is an imposter. It's uh, that it's dangerous. Now the problem is that the, all this stuff, this uh, identity politics, Frankfurt Schoolism, it's all mainstream. It's in the media. It's being pushed in the schools. The police are as politically correct as they could possibly be. Mm. But um, genuine socialists, um, I think, committed idealists are on the increase, really, because you know what is the when the mainstream is this liberal mess that's destroying everything and it's calling itself socialist. Then who's going to have anything to do with that? You know, people don't want to be a part of the failing system. People want to yeah. be part of something that's going to replace it. It's going to be better. So I think, yeah, I think the time for genuine socialism is now. I think um, as the system decays and declines, which it is doing, I think, you know, we are we are the future, really. Right. Well, uh, you never know. You might end up um, <laughs> having a chat with Tom Parsons at uh, the People's Revolution Party in British Fight and getting involved in that one. I certainly would like to see that happen. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap it up? Anything you'd like to let our listeners know about any any events coming up or just the general message? Uh, well, I was just going to say, if, uh, if anybody's listening and you think that uh, hopefully this, you know, you might have come to the uh, to the discussion thinking, oh, socialism, it's all this evil state control of everything, anti-freedom thing. If you've actually listened to this and you realise that, yeah, it's uh, socialism is about looking after each other, you know, putting the borders in place, making sure they have control of who's coming into the country and who's not, you know, because, yeah, in a nutshell, open borders is capitalist, yeah? Mm. Close borders, socialist. It's as simple as that. If you want to have control of your country, if you want to do what's best for you, for your friends, for your family, of you know, it's of, and it's nothing racist about it. That's for for everybody who's here. You know, if you can now see that uh, that socialism is not this evil thing that is painted in the media, but it actually is the solution to the problems of liberalism and capitalism, then yeah, get in touch with us. Come and have a word. You might, uh, you know, if you like what you hear, come and join us. Right. Okay. And there is just one actually one thing actually I did remember that we haven't touched on yet. What's happened? Well, we have a little bit, but what's what's happening with Brexit? Do you think it's going to be a hard Brexit? Do you think we're going to get this silly deal signed? What's your prediction? Oh, it's an absolute nightmare, isn't it? Oh, because <laughs> is it in a nutshell? It is an absolute nightmare. Yeah. You know, the politicians they're doing everything they possibly can to keep us tethered to the European Union, and. I can't see it. I can't see us getting the Brexit that we we vote. Well, we didn't really vote for this Brexit process, did we? No. You know, we were told you vote for Brexit, you're out. That's it. I think it might be a case of get this deal done and then start campaigning again for the, for round two. You know, that that's probably yeah. what's going to need to happen. I mean, the, the simple thing to do, you know, the, what the government should have done, they should said, right, that's it. We're going on to World Trade Organization rules immediately, and from that point, as a separate country. Then you can start negotiating free trade deals if that's what you want. That's it, yeah. But you don't need to be part of the bloc. You don't need to be associated with the bloc. I mean, Canada's got a deal. There's all sorts of countries that got a deal that are not part of the bloc. Yeah. And, you know, Theresa May, you know, what can you say about that? Oh, dear. Well, I, 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 <laughs> oh, dear I, indeed. I, I had my head in my hands for the last two years anyway, and then I saw her dance in South Africa, and that just that was just yeah. the end of it, so... Yeah, this this uh, this complete robotic dance, wasn't it? Oh, you, you just look and you think, because it wasn't. Um, it's interesting, actually. Just to, I know it's a bit of an aside, really, but uh, wasn't her father tied in with the whole paedophile thing as well? It wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, she was in charge of the investigation. Nothing mm. was done about it. I think there's. I mean, I think there's a big, 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 uh, you know, nest to nest to un- unveil there with, with all this stuff. I think it's uh, and. You know, as again, it's probably for another show, but I think there's going to be some. What goes on, I think, would shock us. To be honest, I've just got this. Uh, it's been. I don't think there's any smoke without fire, and I think a lot of these people are involved in it big time. And um, that's one of the reasons why I kind of hold on to this Q and on thing because it's. Uh, I suppose it's a little bit of faith involved as well. I really do hope they do expose these people. And and as I said, and then I think we can start talking about some proper politics and, and, and really looking at how we can make things better. Because all the time you're living in a society where people like that are controlling things and, and influencing people, you may as well not even bother, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll say, yeah. as far as the, the QAnon thing goes, I'll say to people, be very wary, because we've had so much controlled opposition, haven't we? Yeah, well, that's it, yeah. 
there's always that is, risk. Is this just another case of it? Yeah, that's uh, my, my attitude. Is I'm I'm willing and eager to believe in it, but I'm also skeptical. And you've got to keep it, keep it at arm's length and not get too committed to it. But I must say, some of the things about it, it seems positive. You never know. There's so many layers to the agenda of what it could be. It could be it could be something they can fall back on. That if their plan goes wrong, at least they can maintain some control. Or who knows, maybe there are some good people out there that are just trying to make change. And as I said, I think even if they are, although it's coming from a, a more sort of capitalist, nationalistic way at the moment, I think you've got, we've got to understand that they've got to convert a system. You know what I mean? And I don't think they've got to sort of play to to what's in front of them. And, and uh, if you look at what they're doing, what it, this is what gives me hope. If you look at what QAnon's doing, it seems to be there's no real political agenda as such in terms of economy and stuff it just seems to be reversing the globalist agenda what they're doing attacking it and sometimes they may not be reversing it to play out to some socialist agenda or whatever it's just not doing what the globalists want in terms of how they've been unfolding it they're reversing it and i guess it will be the, the test will be when they do if if they do reverse it where they go from there and then 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 we can really judge them if they do it you know yeah and that's the thing at the end of the day it's all well and good to, to point out to controlled opposition, which we have a lot of problems with. Yeah. But one of the other problems is that if we keep ourselves in our tiny little groups and that completely separated from everybody else, you know, we might achieve ideological purity, but we're just going to achieve um, victory inside our ghettos. Mm. So really, you have to you have to take risks, don't you? Yeah. That's it. And you've got to reach out with people that with with common sense that can at least look at look at a problem that's on the table and. Mm. Uh, do it, but you're right there. Uh, yeah, was, I think it was a cat outside. <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll leave it there then. The cat's probably uh, rounded out for us. Thanks for coming on, Ross. It's a pleasure. And we're always welcome to have you, have you back on the show. Um, Thank you very you much. Know, maybe we'll mix it up and get some other people on. We'll have a around the table talk at some stage, and that, that'll be really interesting. Um, but until then, we'll be uh, looking forward to the next time. Definitely. Thank you very much again. Cheers.